Welcome to All Things Green. I'm Anton, here with my co-host Shelby to discuss a variety of topics from across the sustainability universe. Shelby, how are you doing today? I'm doing about as well as that cabbage over there, I think. Yeah. So on a scale from one to cabbage, how well are you doing? I'm about cabbage. Yeah? That's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty good. So uh, I actually biked into work today with about 50 pounds of cabbage um, in two separate tote bags on my handlebars of my bike. Um, I went to the local historic uh, West Side Market to buy some cabbage to make some sauerkraut. I love that. Yeah. And l listeners, viewers, I want you all to know he did look just as sweaty as you would expect a man who biked with 50 pounds of cabbage to look. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and one, of the, one of the great things about uh, cabbage is you can make cabbage rolls. So, you know, you just kind of like stuff the meat in and you kind of fold it over like that and you pinch the sides in, you make a nice cabbage roll. That's like a, a super traditional Croatian dish. So I'm super excited to bring some samples in for everybody next time. I'm excited to try it. Yeah. Even though the smell of cabbage, 50 pounds of it, is a little overwhelming. Uh, I'm excited to <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna get a candle um, that smells like cabbage anytime soon, but I am excited. But Anton, what's the difference between cabbage and lettuce? So uh, cabbage is a brassica. Okay. It's, it's your uh, broccolis, your cauliflowers, and your Brussels sprouts. Okay. Uh, lettuce is lettuce. Lettuce is just not a brassica. I don't know. I can't. I can't pronounce what lettuce is. Lettuce doesn't have any friends. Yeah, exactly. Cabbage has plenty. Got it. Well, <laughs> maybe. Let us move on. Uh, let's talk about something green. How about some money? Oh. Some uh, economics, some finance. Does that sound all right? All of that sounds great to me. That was a, that was, that was a good, good transition, Shelby. <laughs> Thanks for commenting yeah. on it. It makes it even better. Yeah. Oh, my, my pleasure. <laughs> well, you know, the first segment we're going we're gonna to kind of get into unethical pork, all right? Are you bringing pigs into the office too today? or Not today. Okay. That's, that's the other episode that we're planning. Got it. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I wanted to talk to you about today was Proposition 12. This is a California law that was passed in 2018. It's supposed to regulate uh, what kind of pork comes into, well, all kinds of animal products come into California. Uh, they don't want any unethical, overcrowded animals uh, being sold to California. It's really a, a, a landmark type of piece of legislation that's supposed to protect animal rights. Yeah, and so when we talk about the ways that animals are treated not so well, what's an example of that? Right, it, it could be like uh, they only have room to like lay down or stand up um, mm -hmm. because they're just so crowded in these cages, uh, maybe they can't even turn around. And so uh, having more space for these animals, uh, raising them in less cruel conditions. I mean, I guess they still go to the slaughter. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's the first time that they even see daylight, you know, Ugh. like crazy stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, so California is really trying to pioneer and, and take a stand for animal rights with this legislation. This sounds like good news. It's good news. It actually recently went to the Supreme Court, though, um, for a reason not about animal rights. It was actually about, um, it was actually about interstate commerce. I've heard a little bit about this. They used the Commerce Clause argument, I think, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Take yeah. it away. Commerce Clause, per my limited understanding as not a lawyer, essentially says that states don't get to regulate interstate uh, mm -hmm. trade, that that's something that only Congress can do. And so other states were essentially complaining because even though California made this law about just their feelings about the pork industry and animal rights, you know, we're, we're not going to buy products that are made like this. That's right. That other states essentially said, well, that's going to impact us. You're essentially regulating. That was their argument. But Supreme Court said no. Yeah, they went all the way, the, the challenge went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a conservative majority, the vote was 5-4. Uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, nominated by Trump in 2017, actually said, um, in his opinion, California voters overwhelmingly endorsed the ethical pork law in 2018, and they have the right to decide what products appear on store shelves. I love that. Yeah. So even with the conservative majority, the Supreme Court was like, this is not violating the Commerce Clause. This is about states' rights to choose what, what they want. So yeah, that that's, sounds great for us. Yeah, absolutely. And California, they consume... 13% of the United States pork, but they only produce less than 1% of pork, right? So this is this is really going to affect 
a lot of other farmers in other states that are going to be selling to Californians. I mean, it's really uh, kind of remarkable that the state of California's buying power is going to have so much sway in making uh, their standards more ethical for the making uh, the nation's standards more ethical for uh, these pigs. Right, because California is buying so much of it that everybody's going to have to change because of this law. That's yeah. That sounds like a step in the right direction. Yeah, it actually reminds me a little bit of that one episode where we talked about um, Texas and the textbooks. Do yes, you remember that episode absolutely. that you did? Absolutely. Yeah. Where because Texas was trying to show both sides of climate change yeah. and they bought all these textbooks, they were afraid that it was going to make all textbooks be less scientifically accurate about climate change. So yeah, it's similar, but this one I'm much more happy about. Right. Oh, yeah. that's, <laughs> no, that's a great way to put it. Uh, I just think that's a super interesting story about states buying power. Um, it's going to make a, it's going to really influence a lot of farmers around the country. And also not to mention, it's just a great way to reduce animal cruelty. So it's, it's kind of a win, right? Yeah, I think it's definitely a win. We've talked a little bit about states buying power, but can I take us in a direction to talking about the nation's buying power? Yeah, please do. Or maybe borrowing power is more accurate. <laughs> so if you're even a little tuned into the news, you're definitely hearing about the debt ceiling. Yeah, It's the only thing that I'm reading about these days, or at least that's what it feels like. Every newsletter that I get, whether it's about general news or health or the climate, all of it is focusing on the debt ceiling. Um, and since we're talking about economy and finance today, I wanted to talk about how the nation's economic and financial policies really trickle into impacts on all these other things that we care about. So does that sound good? That sounds great. Let's hear it. Okay. Well, it sounds great to talk about, but I have to say it's going to be kind of bad news for us in a lot of ways. Yeah. So <laughs> the Senate did pass the bill that would extend the debt limit through um, January of 2025, which is really good news. It would be a terrible thing for the U.S. to default on all of its uh, credits that it's taken out. So first I kind of want to level set what the debt ceiling is, and yeah. then we can talk about that, how that kind of comes back to our interest in all things green. So first, what's the debt limit? Why is it important? The bill that raises the debt ceiling is really just something that extends our ability to make sure we pay back things that we've already taken out. Now, this is not new. We've done this over and over. In fact, we've done it 89 times, and it doesn't matter which party is in power. Yeah. I've heard some people compare this to giving someone irresponsible with money a new credit card and letting them go wild, <laughs> but that's not really true. We're not taking out new debt. We're just agreeing to pay the debt that we have. Yeah doesn't mean that this is perfect, and we'll talk today about the environmental reasons it's not perfect, um, but that's kind of the basics. And I do have a really helpful infographic in the show notes that talks about what the debt ceiling is in a little more detail and gives you a little more information in a really easy to understand that sounds great. visual manner. So the thing that I think is just most important is that the U.S. doesn't default on its debts. It would have massive national and international consequences if we were allow ourselves to default on our debts. That means that both Republicans and Democrats have a vested interest in coming to a deal that allows us to raise the debt limit. So have you been seeing this across your feeds lately as much as I have? I have been, yeah. I mean... I'm a little bit bummed with some of the environmental impacts. I know that you're going to get into it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, especially the uh, Mountain Valley Pipeway, like just more fracking, more dirty industry. I'll let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I just want to be really clear that at the time of filming, this has passed through the Senate, but Biden hasn't signed it. So some things could change, but we're not expecting any major changes. So. Yeah. This is what stands as of right now. I think there are three big losses for environmental causes in the deal that we eventually struck for the debt ceiling. So you already mentioned the first one, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is gonna be expedited. This was mostly to get Senator Joe Manchin on board. He's a senator from West Virginia. Yeah. This is important to his state because it would stretch this 300 mile pipeline from West Virginia to North Carolina to carry national not national, natural gas. Yeah. Um, and that is a huge deal. I mean, for him, it's a huge deal economically. Yeah. Benefits to the finances of West Virginia. Right. That's why it was pushed for. 
but it also has an environmental impact of about 89 million metric tons of carbon dioxide released annually. To put that in perspective, that's like 26 new coal plants or 19 million new passenger vehicles. Not to mention we're getting millions of barrels of radioactive toxic oil and gas waste from West Virginia injected into Ohio. So just yeah. wanted to plug that. I'm Absolutely. a little bit angry with Senator Manchin for that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Senator Manchin has always been, you know, this Democrat who sometimes will push uh, against the environmental protections that we're interested in. So right. that is in the deal expediting that pipeline, which means it has to go through fewer regulations, and it's probably going to happen. That's right. It also, the debt bill rolls back the National Environmental Policy Act so that it now exempts oil and gas pipelines from regulations under this act. That's a huge deal, too, because it means that similar to the Mountain Valley pipeline we already talked about, new oil and gas pipelines will be able to go in with fewer regulations. They'll be expedited projects. And what happens when we do things fast? It means we also do things dirty. Yeah, It's not good news for any of us. And then the last big loss I think we're seeing is that this bill is going to freeze non-defense spending for agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of the Interior, which runs our national parks. Yeah, You talked in an episode a while ago when we were talking about in Texas, another Texas reference, we were talking about in Texas how citizens uh, weren't able to call in issues that they saw more than three times because the Texas Environmental Quality Commission uh, was essentially saying people were abusing their power yeah. by calling it in. But then your perspective, I think, was, well, some of these agencies can be really slow. That Yeah, working with Ohio EPA, sometimes you hardly hear back from them at all, or Ohio Department of Natural Resources, or even Ohio Department of Health. So yeah. just uh, limiting the spending of these agencies, uh, I, I can only see that it would weaken enforcement uh, when you weak, when you weaken the administrations. So I think so too. And right now what we need is not less enforcement for environmental issues. Right. And something that not everyone might understand is that federal agencies then support local agencies. So some of the buckets of money are different and some of them end up just passing through. I know that in my work in public health, I often function under grants or contracts that technically come from Ohio state agencies, but when you follow the money back, they're big federal grant programs, like yeah. I'm being funded by Ohio Department of Health, but they're being funded by the Centers for Disease Control. Yeah. So any time that we're affecting these big national agencies, it, it also reduces power from state agencies and local agencies too. There you go. So these are three pieces of really bad news, and that that doesn't feel very good to me. No, I mean, I, I would really love to see our government work for young people and make sure that we have a future in an earth that's livable. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't know how we can make environment more of a priority. Uh, I, it's really disappointing to see these losses in the in the debt ceiling deal. Yeah. But uh, we got to just keep on keeping on. I think so too. And I I do want to put it into perspective that this these are not the only losses that we as a nation are facing because of the debt deal. Our focus here is on the environment and these are the ones that feel really relevant, but we also added more work requirements for SNAP. There are tons of other things that were compromised on that I personally feel really passionate about. Yeah. We need these things. We need people to pay their taxes so that we can provide social services. I think our role as environmental leaders is to make sure that things like this, as you said, prioritization, move further up the pipeline of what we as a nation care about. Yeah because that's what we're really doing. We're never gonna get everything that we want mm -hmm. when we're talking about trillions of dollars that right. we're trying to manage, but there are probably places that we are spending that could better be allocated. And here we're talking about better allocating things towards knowing that our environment is important and that the future, as you said, of young people and people after that rely on these issues. So. That's right. The immediate benefit for one state's economy based on a new pipeline is definitely going to have negative economic consequences in the future. So I'm sorry to say that there's not really a silver lining here of something that's going just great, other than I guess we 
we didn't default on our debts as a nation. That, you know, <laughs> this bill was passed. That's good news. Um, but our role is to keep doing advocacy and thinking about how these three specific issues will reverberate into the rest of our work. Yeah, 100 percent. Well, Shelby, let me take us into our last segment. Uh, it's actually about uh, a local economy. Okay, state, fun. national, and yeah, local. Kind of fun how that went, right? <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about buying local veggies. I love this. Local veggies are sustainable veggies, are okay. healthy veggies. Absolutely they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, having talked about state buying power, I wanted to talk about your buying power as a consumer and how that can actually affect your local economy. So getting into it, um, the Fair Food Network made a blog post talking about some of the benefits of buying local food. So aside from, a, aside from maybe just like a tastier, fresher, maybe even slightly more nutritious. Yes, you're not, you're not wrong, definitely more nutritious. Yeah, all of, those, all of those good things. Local food, they don't have to go through all this post-processing distribution type of network. And so sometimes those cost savings actually end up uh, at, uh, to the consumer. Like yeah. the consumer will save a little bit of money. Uh, not to mention, uh, we also see a multiplier effect of uh, when, when we spend money on a local farmer, they're going to buy that local compost and those local supplies and put money back into the local economy. Yeah. So that money, that, that w you wouldn't see that money if you were having a, uh, if you were buying from a Walmart where veggies are coming from a huge farmer from out of state or something, they're not yeah. going to spend money on supplies in your area. They also employ people locally. I know a, yeah. a lot of local farmers. And so you're right. They're purchasing things locally, but they're also invested in our community in a way that a farmer from out of state may not be. They're going to hire people that are from here. It, it works in our favor in basically every way. Yeah, and actually a fun anecdote about um, employing people locally is uh, Ohio City Farm, where we are located in Ohio City, a neighborhood of Cleveland, they actually work with the Refugee Response, which actually employs people um, who have maybe fled their country and are looking for better opportunity here, and they employ them locally. So I just think that's really cool, really unique. Yeah, I love the Refugee Response, and I love being able to think about what we're eating and who we're serving and our community as a whole when we just put something on our plate. That's yeah. a great feeling. Absolutely. And how does this all tie into sustainability? I don't know, Anton. Tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think, if you think about um, maybe your veggies coming from Southwest, uh, Southwest, uh, the Southwest, of the United States. Of the United States. <laughs> that's, that's a long time to travel all the way to Ohio to get to your plate. Um, there's a lot of greenhouse gases and a lot of carbon emissions that go into getting your food from point A to point B. Yeah. Or, and, uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say you said earlier uh, that local food is sometimes more nutritious. And because you started talking about the distance it has to travel, I wanted to echo yeah. that point and say that's actually true, um, especially when we talk about fresh foods. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not at all saying like an apple that traveled isn't good for you anymore. Please still eat your fruits and vegetables. Eat <laughs> what you have access to. But when we collect foods that are fresh, we get them at like their height of nutritional value. And that's why even if you're at the grocery store, fun tip for folks who maybe don't have access to local foods or don't feel that in their budget right now, buying frozen fruits and vegetables, those are frozen at their peak freshness. And so they also have a really, really high nutritional content. Um, you can do that with your local food too, though, if you've got extra. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we should maybe talk a little bit about ways that we can uh, purchase more sustainably. Yes. And so uh, there's actually a few. I, I was a part of the Ohio City Farms CSA. Uh, that's kind of like a subscription service. You, you pay up front. I want this plan for me. It maybe feeds a family of four or maybe uh, just a two-person household. Uh, and you get veggies weekly. You kind of just pick them up at, at your pickup location. For those who don't know, what's CSA stand for? Uh, community. Supported. Supported. Agriculture. <laughs> Agriculture. Thank you, Shelby. <laughs> I just knew it as CSA. You learn something new every day. But uh, a CSA is a great way to get your produce. You can even get meat, or some farms have a combination of both meat and produce. Yeah. So getting that locally sourced uh, 
food from your own uh, neck of the woods is amazing. I'm looking forward to signing up for mine when I move in closer to the city this summer. Yeah, oh, it was really good. I would recommend it. Um, even just going to like your local farmer's market too. I know in my neck of the woods, uh, West Park has a farmer's market every Sunday. And so I just love going, picking up some local veggies for my week. Um, or even just going to like your local butcher shop. They might have, they might get their hogs and stuff from uh, Ashland County or you know a county nearby, even if it's not in your metropolitan area. Uh, it ships a lot closer than if you were to get your pork from wherever the next state over. Absolutely, and just a shout out to Farmer's Market Outfits. I'm, uh, just if anyone needs any extra motivation to go to the Farmer's Market, how cute do you look when you're walking around <laughs> with your little tote bag and your little Farmer's Market dress? Is that just me? I don't think so. Just an added benefit. No, I think I think a lot of people feel similarly. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm more of like a get in, get out type of guy instead of prancing around yeah, with well, my you, tote bag. you have to take it all back on your bike, so you've got a <laughs> you got a different. Uh, I'm I'm trying to do things where I can walk home or maybe put it in the trunk of my car because yeah. you know I'm not a strong cyclist. <laughs> That's yet. okay. We'll work on it. But uh, I I think uh, another great way to get your local food is to maybe even just start your own garden. Like that's the most sustainable way you can do. Like start some seeds, grow some food. Uh, you don't have to create this huge garden and try to get all your fruits and veggies sourced from your garden, but like maybe just try like a potted tomato plant or something like that, you know, just kind of get started and try it out. Absolutely. And I know that you've given me tips. This might've been off air about where you can get <laughs> seeds, but yeah. uh, if someone wanted to start a garden, where would you recommend that they start as far as like getting the seeds that they need? Yeah. Cleveland actually has a really cool um, seed exchange program where people can just come in uh, you have the option to pay $5 as a donation, and you can get anything from native plant seeds to like your heirloom seeds uh, that are sometimes even harder to find. So you can get anything from your tomatoes to your cucumbers, onions, garlic, the list goes on. Um, if you don't have a seed exchange in your town, uh, I would honestly just go and find a local uh, nursery, plant nursery or something like that, and get seeds from them. Absolutely. Even my library has a seed exchange. Oh, shoot. Yeah, That's like cool. a seed library. And so you can take packets of seeds. And even some fruits and vegetables that you purchase, you can replant those seeds. Or oh, sometimes yeah. you don't even have to replant them. When I buy green onions, you know, I'm sh you just chop them all down and yeah. then put it in a little glass of water and they regrow right there. Yeah. I don't even have a window in my kitchen and they still regrow quite well. That's really cool. I actually have to try that. I haven't tried that yet. It's so easy. It requires absolutely zero work, uh, maybe 1% work to just change out the water every once in a while. <laughs> but yeah, there's lots of low barrier to entry points to start growing your own yeah. food. And I think one of the big takeaways is environment and economy, they, they don't have to be separate issues. They could be tight-knit. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, what's good for the environment can be good for the economy. Totally. So I think that's cool. I want our viewers to, to take that away. And also the buying power of me and you as consumers, it can really help a local economy. So yeah. absolutely. Yeah. As I've been looking for my future home, one of the biggest things that I wanted was to be within a place that I could walk to local businesses, especially food related businesses. Um, genuinely every time I looked at an address I would put it into Google Maps and see how close it was to my favorite bakery so That's that I cool. could buy bread that was made just down the street from me so yeah, yeah I love supporting local food so local business in general yeah it's 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 great stuff well Shelby thank you so much for talking all things green with me how about you let our viewers know how they can stay in touch with us absolutely I can if you'd like to stay connected to us, be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at One Planet Media. That's O N E 1. And if you'd like to rewatch full episodes, check out our YouTube channel, All Things Green Show. You can find all of our sources from today's episodes in our show notes. We'll be back the same time next week to bring you more news. Thank you so much for being a part of the global sustainability movement. Mm.